Today's message is entitled, Prophecy, the Big Picture, Part 2, the Red Heifer. Now, one thing about Mark Carnes, I will probably go down in history as the pastor that's got the longest titles of any person on planet Earth. And I don't do them intentionally. They just come out that way. I try to get as much information in the, actually what it is, is when I go back to look through my records, sometimes it's easy for me to find it if I've got it all in the title. Okay, so there's my secret. So anyway, that's the title of this message. Last week we started this series, uh, series of messages, messages, slow down Mark, and these are based on individual end time events, okay, or as I like to call it, puzzle pieces that, that make up the big picture of prophecy. So this is what we're doing. We're going to give a piece of, a puzzle piece at a time until we get the big picture kind of made up. Now, last week we talked about and started off with the first puzzle piece, which was the uh, three solar eclipses that took, went, you know, lasted over a period of seven years. We talked about that. We talked about that uh, we believe that those are warnings from God toward the USA for the way that the USA is living and acting right now. We talked about how that those three uh, different eclipses, the paths that they took, how that they had three intersecting points, made it, made it look like an A, and how that the one down uh, in the edge of Texas there is where that Hurricane Harvey came in a few days after that took place. And we looked at the one that intersected out on the West Coast, and I personally believe, it may not be right, but I believe that's where that uh, COVID was sent to us from China over to the port of Oregon and how it got out because that's where the first death was and the first case was. I believe that all fits into it. And we know that the third point that we talked about last week was right over a major earthquake fault, seismic area. It may not, and I hope and pray that it doesn't happen, but one of the messages that we will be doing will be Mystery Babylon. A lot of people have a lot of different speculations what Mystery Babylon is. Wherever this place is that is Mystery Babylon, that country or nation or whatever it is, I personally think it's the United States because after that point in time, we don't hear anything else about the United States. So I believe that what it's talking about is this country. may not be, but that's where I'm at right now. But it's talking about how that it will be broke into three pieces. In other words, there's going to be an earthquake that is going to separate whatever country that is. may not be this one, but it is going to separate that into three pieces. And a lot of people believe that that earthquake fault that we're talking about, the New Madrid, could be the very one to do it, okay? So the way things are falling into place right now, prophetically, wouldn't surprise me a bit. So just that's one of the things we'll be talking about, and we'll really get deep into that. Okay, today, the second puzzle piece. Over the past few months... Uh, we've all been hearing about the potential of a sacrifice of a red heifer in Israel. So before we get into this coming sacrifice, uh, we need to find out a little bit more about what the red heifer sacrifice is all about and the very first mention of this red heifer sacrifice in our Bibles. And that is found in the book of Numbers. So if you'd like to stand... We're going to read that very first account of um, the red heifer sacrifice in Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. NLT on this, we'll be looking at the King James Version on some stuff also today. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Here is another legal requirement commanded by the Lord. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer, a perfect animal that has no defects and has never been yoked to a plow. Give it to Eleazar the priest, and it will be taken outside the camp and slaughtered. Now remember that outside the camp, that's important. And slaughtered in his presence. Eleazar will take some of its blood on his finger, finger and he will sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tabernacle. As Eleazar watches, the heifer must be burned, its hide, its meat, its blood, and its dung. Eleazar, the priest, must then take a stick of cedar, a hyssop branch, and some scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire where the heifer is burning. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for all that you do, Lord. We thank you for giving us word, Lord God, that reveals what is going to happen in our future, Lord. It's not that you didn't put us here and, and make us wonder, Lord. You give us you give us the revelation. You give us all of these different prophecies, Lord, so that we will know what's going to happen in our future. It's up to us to study and find out and read them for ourselves, Lord. But Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you for a church, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that you will put your hands upon this church, Lord. I pray that you'll put a protection of safety upon this church, Lord, where that these radical people, Lord, that want to kill all Christians and kill anything other than their belief, that, to, that, Lord, that you will just keep them outside these walls, Lord, not let them come in. So we're praying for your hand of protection upon each and every one of us in this building, in this place, Lord, and in our lives, Lord, as people know that we are Christians, Lord. So we pray for your protection. We pray, Lord God, that you will just bless this message, Lord. We pray, Lord, that I will only say what you would have me to say, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll just control my lips and my jaws. Loosen them, Lord, where that I can get this word out, Lord. Keep Satan off my back, Lord God. It seems like every time I try to preach a message here lately, Satan's on me so much I, I just can't hardly even preach. So I pray, Lord God, that you'll just uh, knock him off my shoulders, knock him out the door where he belongs. And uh, I pray, Lord God, that you'll just bless us all, Lord. Help everyone here to hear the message that you want them to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. All right. Red heifer. What in the world is going on here? What is the purpose of sacrificing a red heifer instead of a lamb that we're kind of used to hearing about uh, in the Bible? So in order to answer these questions a little bit more about the red heifer, we must actually go back further in the Bible, further than numbers, back to the book of Exodus, the one before it. And this is where God is using Moses and his brother Aaron to set the captives free. We know that the Israelites, the Jewish people, were being held captive and used as slaves in Egypt by Pharaoh. Now when we think about Pharaoh, we think about Pharaoh as being a king. But a Pharaoh was believed by those people back in those days, the Egyptians. They, they believed that a Pharaoh was of divine or a divine intermediary between the gods, little g gods, and the world of men. So God sent Moses and Aaron as a messenger to Pharaoh to, rele to release his people, the Israelites. Now, we know the story of what happened. We've seen, the, we've seen the movie, right? We've seen the Ten Commandments, okay? We grew up, we heard, uh, th those of us that was uh, fortunate enough to go to Sunday school, we heard the stories. So we know what we're talking about here. We know that we're talking about uh, that time of the Ten Commandments was given and uh, the story of Moses. All right. So finally, we know that they did escape by the power of God's help. And they wound up in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai for a pretty good wall there. God instructed the brothers, Aaron and Moses, to build a portable tent tabernacle. Something that could be moved as they would travel and they could reset it up. So a tabernacle means a place of meeting. It means a, or a tent of meeting. <clears throat> Since this was a place where God dwelt among his people here on earth, the Ark of the Covenant, the menorah, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense were made, all made in that wilderness and put inside that temple. Now today we would refer to, or I said temple, tabernacle. Today we would refer to it as being a temple. So this is where God came to earth to tabernacle with men. He came to live with his chosen people, the Jewish people. And the Jewish people were the descendants of Shem. Now let me, read, let me throw this in there. When uh, Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives got off the boat, Noah and his wife, as far as we know, didn't have any more children. So there was three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. So these are the descendants of Shem. Shem is where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that bloodline came from all the way up through Jesus, through Mary. All right? But in this place where they was at, at the foot of the mountain, 
This is where God gave the laws of the first covenant. He gave the law to the Jewish people. And it, or the first testament. The Old Testament as, as we call it. I always considered it as a deal. He, that's where God made a deal with mankind. You do this and you'll get this. So he made a deal. Deal, testament, covenant, all the same thing. There were many different sacrifices in those days that were instructed by God. And we're, as we, you can find out more about that if you want to read about it in Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus. Now these sacrifices were in two groups. Number one, there were voluntary sacrifices. And number two, there were mandatory sacrifices. And all of this is leading up to where we're going with the red heifer here. There were three voluntary offerings or sacrifices. The first was a burnt offering, and that was a voluntary act of worship to express devotion or commitment to God. It was used as an atonement. That's a cover. Atonement is a cover to cover the sin. And this was actually for unintentional sin. All right, there was a difference in that also. The elements of the burnt offering were either a bull or a bird or a ram, and all of them had to be without blemish. So you couldn't take the old uh, heifer that broke her leg or the old goat that had his horn tore off or something that wouldn't, you couldn't take the junk to him. You took your best. They had to be unblemished. Now the meat and the bones and the organs of those animals were to totally burnt, and that was God's portion. That's what God's, I guess he smelt it in the savor is the way I've heard it explained. Now the second voluntary offering was a grain offering in which the fruit of the field was offered in the form of a cake or bread, baked bread. And it was made from grain, fine flour, oil, and salt. Now a grain offering was one of the sacrifices that was accompanied by a drink offering, which was, all, which was about a quart of wine, about a quart of wine. And uh, it was poured on the fire on the altar. Now the purpose of the grain offering was to express thanksgiving and recognition to, uh, to and of God's provision of unmerited goodwill toward the person making the sacrifice. Now the third voluntary offering was a peace offering which, which consisted of an unblemished animal from the worshiper's herd or, and or various grains and breads. This sacrifice of thanksgiving and fellowship followed by a shared meal. Again, important. Now, if you notice that the voluntary offerings are representations of somebody that's coming down the road, representations of Jesus by voluntarily offering up himself for our sins and the last supper that we celebrate when we celebrate communion and by breaking of the bread and drinking of the wine and in fellowship. Now remember, these events, these events happened 1500 years before Jesus came to earth. So when they were in that wilderness, that was 1500 years before Jesus came to earth. But there were also two mandatory sacrifices. What were they? Well, the first one was a sin offering. Now, the purpose of a sin offering was to atone or cover sin and cleanse from defilement. Now, those offerings, those sacrifices, they couldn't take away sin, but they covered it. They secured it until the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ, none other, no one else could have done it until he came and died. So this was a cleanse from defilement. There were five possible elements of a sin sacrifice. A young bull, a male goat, a female goat, a dove or a pigeon, just considered as a bird, or one-tenth ephra. And an ephra, uh, one-tenth of an ephra, and I know I'm saying that wrong, of fine flour, an ephra. Ifa, that's the way it's supposed to be pronounced. She's been schooling me on how to uh, speak this. So an ifa is a Hebrew unit of dry measure, and it equals about a bushel or eight gallons of you of dry U.S. our our scale. So that would be approximately one tenth of a bushel today of this fine flour. That's an ifa. Okay, so now you learned something this morning. The type of animal that we just described 
depended on the identity and the financial situation of the person that was sacrificing it or the giver. Now, a female goat was the sin offering for a common person. So everybody that was just a common person out there, they usually put a, a female goat up. If a person was a little above common and they had a little bit more, bigger herds, bigger crops or whatever, had a little more money, they would put up a male goat because a male goat cost more in those days. But if a person was a poor person and they couldn't come up with a female goat or any kind of goat, they could put up on the offer, take it in, and they could put up a dove or a pigeon. And that dove or pigeon represented that female goat or the male goat. Now, if a person was very poor, I mean very poor, they couldn't even come up with a pigeon or a turtle dove, they could take that fine flour and they could take that and they could give that to the priest and the priest would take it in and he would sprinkle that on the altar and that represented that dove or pigeon that represented the female goat. All right? So, if you think about that, God always makes a way for everybody. Everybody. He always has back then and He still does today. So it doesn't matter what kind of standings we're in in this world or in this country or anything else, He always makes a way. Now, the, the uh, bull that was mentioned, uh, that was actually made for... Uh, it was offered up as a sacrifice for the high priest and the congregation as a whole, and so on. So each of these uh, specific sacrifices uh, had instructions on what to do with the blood of the animal uh, during the ceremony. So everybody was, could be taken care of if they wanted to be, just like today. Everybody has the ability to become a born-again Christian, but it's your choice. Now, the second mandatory sacrifice was a trespass offering. Now, this was a sacrifice, uh, was exclusively a ram. Had to be a ram, couldn't be anything else. The trespass offering was given as an atonement for unintentional sins that required reimbursement to an offended party and also as cleansing from defiling sins or physical maletudes uh, illness, affliction, or complaint. So the way I look at this is, if you was a farmer or a herdsman and you had a bunch of, uh, let's just say uh, goats, for instance, and you was herding them across country and you herded them across somebody's land, basically trespassing on their land, and they had a bunch of chickens and your goat uh, trampled all those chickens and killed it, not only did you owe that person for, uh, for those chickens, okay, you had to put this sacrifice up. So basically what you was doing is cooking him a big meal and giving it to him after you paid for the chickens, okay? So that was how this trespass offering kind of worked. Now I want you to think about this, and this is kind of going to set the stage for the rest of the message. Just keep this in mind. Had the Jewish people, had the Jewish people accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the thousand year physical, keyword physical, physical reign of Jesus Christ would have started right then, which was actually exactly what the Jewish people were praying for and what they wanted, but they did not believe and accept Jesus. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is this. We have done a lot of studying and we know that after the battle of Armageddon, the people that come back with Jesus, the, the Jews that have been rescued, we go into, and, and I always want to think it's like we're going into a valley or someplace, but really we're staying here. But we go into a time period called the thousand year millennial reign. And it is the seventh day or the seventh. Okay. So the seventh is rest. So it's 6,000 years have passed. We're pretty much at the end of the 6,000 years right now. That's the six days of work. We're re getting ready to go into rest. So for a thousand years, Jesus will be on the throne. King of the world for a thousand years. Satan and his demonic garbage will be bound. We don't have to put up with them. We've talked about this a lot. 
But that would have happened if they had have accepted Jesus when Jesus came on the scene. Had his people had have accepted him, he would have become the king of the world and it would have been a physical rule and reign for a thousand years. And if you think about it now, since we're 2,000 years later, that would have ended about a thousand years ago. So this earth would have done burnt over and done had a new, a new heaven and a new earth created and it would be totally different than what it is now. But because they didn't accept Jesus' sacrifice or Jesus as the Messiah, that deal didn't work. They missed the boat. Okay? So not only did they miss the boat there, they missed the boat. And I'm not trying to talk bad about the Jewish people. We are to, uh, we are to pray for the Jewish people. They are still God's chosen people and God has a plan for them and a big plan for them. And we're going to be learning more about that over the next few weeks. So don't hold it against them, but they did. They missed the boat because they didn't accept Jesus. So with all that said, what about the red heifer sacrifice? Now, I guess the first question should be asked is, has there ever been a red heifer sacrificed? Has there? Well, the question is, or the answer to the question is, yes. There have been nine, nine, only nine, known red heifer sacrifice since the time of Moses. And that was up till the time of the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. Since that time in 70 AD, there has been no known red heifer sacrifices at all since that time. Now, here's a key player. If you're taking notes, write this guy's name down. He was a rabbi. So Rabbi Moses ben Maimon. M-A-I-M-O-N. Rabbi Moses ben Maimon. This is a person. Has anybody in here ever heard of this guy? Probably not. Very important creature or <laughs> a person, I guess. Very important person to the Jewish people. Okay. Now, it was said that he was said to be one of the greatest arbiters of all times on the matter of Jewish law and one of the greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages. He was a scientist. He was a doctor, a researcher, and a preeminent leader who lived from the year 1138 up until the year 1204 A.D., so on this side of Jesus. Now, he taught in his teachings, he taught that the 10th red heifer ceremony, which is what they're trying to do right now, okay? So nine's been, they're getting ready. The 10th red heifer ceremony would bring in the messianic age. In some of his writings, he taught that the 10th red heifer uh, would be slaughtered by the Messiah himself. Did y'all get that? Very important. He taught that the tenth red heifer that would be sacrificed, whenever that may be, that it would usher in the Messiah coming. Okay? They're still looking for the Messiah. They didn't accept the real Messiah, so they're still looking for the Messiah. And he thinks, or he said that he thought that the Messiah himself would slaughter this red heifer. Now, the followers of Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, which are called Maimonides, they describe, and this is where I get real ill, okay? They describe Jesus as a failed Messiah. That's enough to get anybody's blood pressure up, right? definitely does mine but they they look at him as uh, jesus was a failed messiah and they say it was foreseen by the prophet daniel rather than redeeming israel the maimonides write that jesus caused jews to be killed and exiled and changed the torah and led to the world led the world to worship a false god in other words, it appears that they are saying, these Maimonides, that they are saying that Jesus is a false god. Okay? This is the problem. The Jewish people are following this guy. Okay? It's very obvious that this Rabbi Moses Ben could not think in spiritual terms. 
but only in physical terms. Always got to determine when you're studying the word, is it talking about something physical, something spiritual? Who's doing the talking? Who's that person talking to? If you don't understand them things, you cannot understand the word. He nor the Jewish people today understood what the Messiah came to earth to do, Jesus. They taught, thought that he would be a great soldier, a great warrior that would defeat their physical enemies such as their previous captors in Egypt and all these other empires. Now, if Jesus had come in and he would have been a seven foot tall, big old soldier guy with a great big sword and he come in and he just whipped all of the Roman Empire and all of their armies, that would have been their guy. But they didn't realize what Jesus' purpose was and why he came. They didn't realize the sin that they had and how that they needed a real, uh, a real sacrifice. All right, everybody with me? Okay, good deal. Good deal. So as our text stated, to meet the requirements of the Old, Tes Old Testament law, a red heifer was originally needed to help accomplish purification of the Israelites from uncleanliness. Specifically, the ashes of a red heifer were needed because the red heifer's ashes were necessary for the purification rites held at the temple. Many have regarded the appearance of a red heifer today as a way of speeding up the construction of the third temple and the return of Christ. Now, notice I said Christ. That throws everybody for a wallop, okay? Because most everybody thinks that Jesus Christ was like Mark Carnes. That was his last name. That's not true. Christ is a title. Christ is a title. So they're still looking for the Christ, just not Jesus attached to it. And they think because of what this said, that if they can get this sacrifice made, this is going to help them to usher in the Messiah coming, the return of Christ, and also the building of the third temple. The building of the third temple. Now, however, we, we have a little bit different uh, aspect on this. We have an evangelical uh, Christian look, and we hold to a futurist view of Bible prophecy. We believe that the third temple will be built and subsequently it will be desecrated by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. We talk about this all the time. And that would take place before the return of the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus at the battle of Armageddon. Okay. Now, where do we get that from? Well, we get it from the part of our Bible that the Jewish people don't look at. Okay. The Jewish people go by the Old Testament, Old Covenant only. When it comes to the New Testament, New Covenant, they don't look at it. So all the things that we see from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way to Revelation, they don't see that part. They don't understand it and they don't go for it. When a Jewish person does read that, you know what happens? They usually get saved. They see it. They get born again. Okay, And they are usually really good for the kingdom of God because they, they know all the old stuff because they can quote, a lot, of, a lot of Jewish people can quote the whole entire Old Testament. So when they hear the new and they know that these parts all go together and it all fits, they have a change. I mean, look at Jonathan Kant. Unbelievable, unbelievable person that God is using there. So when you look at all of that, it just puts everything in place. So we know we can read uh, we can read in the Old Testament these wars that we're talking about in Ezekiel and in uh, Psalm 83. We know that from the Old Testament. But we have the book of Revelation and other prophecies that go into that time period. And we can look at those and we know that there will be, in fact, another third temple built. It's going to happen. And in that middle of that time, we know that the Jewish people are going to have to make a decision. They're going to have to worship the statue of the Antichrist or they're going to have to flee and get out of there. And they flee and get out of there. That's the way it's written. So we know that these things is coming. Okay. And everything that is going to happen in the book of Revelation is coming together right now so that it can happen in the book of Revelation. So that's kind of the difference. So the red heifer 
was a cow that was brought to the priest as a sacrifice according to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Its ashes, now get this, its ashes were used for the ritual purification of corpse uncleanliness. Of a corpse uncleanliness, okay? Caused by an Israelite coming into contact with a human corpse or a human bone or a human grave. So it was to purify them from that uncleanliness. The Israelites were commanded to obtain a red heifer without spot wherein it has no blemish whatsoever. Couldn't have one. Could never be hooked up to a plow or anything like that, been yoked. The heifer would then be slaughtered and burnt. Another key point to remember here. Would burnt, be burnt outside the camp. Not near the temple, not in the temple camp or the tabernacle uh, area, but outside the camp. The red heifer is actually another symbol of Christ's sacrifice, Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Like the red heifer, Jesus was without blemish. He had no sin, he had no blemish. He was sinless, he spoke without malice. God's spotless sacrifice is what he was. In the same way Jesus was crucified, He was crucified where? He was crucified on Golgotha, outside the city gates. And the red heifer was crucified, or crucified, sacrificed outside the city gates on the Mount of Olives later on. Now, it wasn't always there, but it was later. This means that the Jewish people are planning to sacrifice a red heifer on the Mount of Olives. That's exactly what their goal is. So the question is, do the Jews have a red heifer to sacrifice? A perfect red heifer. Well, on September 20th, 2022, an article came out in the Jerusalem Post. And it says, five perfect red heifers required for a ritual purification of those who have touched a dead body arrived in Israel from a ranch in Texas as the Te Temple Institute continues preparation to lay the groundwork for the construction of the third temple in Jerusalem. The heifers are under one year old. That was under one year old on September 20th. Under one year old. And if they remain... If they remain 100% red, they had to have red hoofs, red nose, red everything, all right? If they remain 100% red and avoid any blemishes, because if they run up against a piece of barbed wire and tore a piece of hair off, guess what? Could not be used, disqualified them completely. Another thing to remember too is these red heifers, if they had over two black hairs or over two white hairs, disqualified. These had to be perfect, had to be perfect. So they had to be perfect in order to create the ashes required by Jewish law to purify those who had been in contact with a dead body explained by the Temple Institute. This level of purification would be needed in order to allow the priests to carry out their work in the future temple. So they're getting ready for this temple. They're getting ready. Now, also reporting on September 22 in the All Israel News, one of, the, one of the few Israeli media platforms that have covered a quite fascinating story of how these two groups, a Christian group, a Christian ministry named Boni Israel and the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, how that they beat the supposed one in 50,000 odds of finding not five, but one qualified red heifer. One in 50,000 chances of them finding a red heifer that would qualify. They found five, okay? And the thing about it was, what they did was they, uh, they sent some of the uh, rabbis from Dallas, Texas, and also rabbis from Israel over to examine these calves. They were uh, 
uh, Red Angus is what they were. And their diligence paid off as they found five blemish-free red heifers. Now get this. You know how when a, when a uh, farmer has a, a young heifer or calf or whatever, as soon as he gets up you know, big enough that he looks like he's going to live, what's the first thing they do? They stick a tag in his ear, right? Okay. These heifers are almost a year old, and for some reason they'd never been tagged because if they had put the tag in their ear, guess what? They wouldn't have qualified. So all of this stuff has got to happen, folks. It may not be... Uh, significant to what's really going on in the world, but for, uh, for the purpose, God has definitely put his hand on this coming about. All right? So they had no ear tags, which is, also, you know, like I said, a common practice for, uh, for ranchers and farmers. As of now, and this was a few months ago, as of now, four of the heifers remain blemish-free, and according to the Temple Institute, uh, rabbi Institute, the rabbis from there, uh, they hope to carry out this cel uh, ceremony before Passover 2024. Now, in October of this year, they get too old. They can't use them. So they have to do something before then. But they hope to carry out this ceremony uh, before Passover 2024, which begins on August 22nd. That's one week from tomorrow. They're wanting to do this before that time. And uh, the last of the Passover will be April 30th of this year. Now, despite great interest in some spheres, the story barely made news in Israel. That was shocking to me when I found this out. It, this barely made news in Israel? Whew, that's unbelievable. It's highly unlikely that secular Israelis are aware or even interested in the presence of these red heifers. And when I heard that and I read that, I thought, how in the world could this possibly be? There's not that many Jews. That place is the size of, what, Pittsburgh, a tiny little place. And there's people that has, don't know anything about these red heifers. And then I got to thinking, I thought, well, you know what? About eight years ago, Tanya and I was working on some seminar stuff. And we were putting together these, uh, uh, what do you call them, these slideshow PowerPoints. And uh, in this PowerPoint, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that we talked about back then was, and what we were showing, was that Tel Aviv, Israel, okay, Tel Aviv, it has the highest concentration of gay and lesbian people of any place on planet Earth. Twenty-three to twenty-four percent of Tel Aviv's population. Considered, was considered to be gay or they considered themselves to be gay and lesbian. I mean, you wouldn't think that would be possible there. That blew my mind when I figured that out. But then again, if you look at our nation that was created in God we trust, founded by people wanting to get away from the uh, church in England that made them worship where they wanted you to worship. They get away. They come to America and we set up churches and we start, we, we dedicate this nation to God. And now look at us. Look at us. The majority of the population don't go to church. The majority of the population nowadays couldn't care less about church, Bible or anything else. They care about these things, but they don't care nothing about God or anything else. So when you look at it, it's no different there than it is here, right? It's the same thing. So there were so many people over there that has no idea about anything that is happening. So the question is, what does this have to do with end times prophecy? What does it have to do with it? The true Messiah, Jesus, he's already come to earth. He's already shed his blood on the cross and he died for all the sin and purification for the whole entire world. God is no longer interested in any, sacrifice, any sacrifices or any other kind of rituals. He's not interested in those anymore. Hosea 6.6, 6, King James Version, it says, I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Isaiah 1.11-17 says, What makes you think I, God, I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord. 
I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fatted cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. When you come to worship me, who asks you to parade through my courts with all of your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgust me. As for your celebrations and your new moon celebrations and the Sabbath uh, of the and on the and the Sabbath of your special days for fasting, these are all sinful and false. This is God speaking here. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They burden me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause for orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Matthew, Jesus had something to say about this. Matthew 9.13 says, Jesus speaking here. Now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I came to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Did you notice where God is speaking here in Hosea and Jesus is reiterating the same thing? So in other words, he's saying, you guys, you Jewish people, you are not doing this out of love and compassion toward me. You are doing this. You are bringing these sacrifices and these offerings instead of, in other words, you're trying to buy your way in. You're trying to buy your way in, the way I look at it. Because, and you think you're righteous by doing these things, but you're not. Only God is righteous, only Jesus. Okay? The purpose of these verses is to show you from the very first prophecy where God is letting everyone know He would be sending a Savior. Here He was letting us know that without a loving relationship with God our Father, there are no rituals or sacrifices in the world that can help us. God cares more about our heart's love toward Him. He don't care about the sacrifices anymore at all. We must not substitute religious traditions, and we do this big time in our country today in a lot of churches, we must not substitute religious traditions and practicing of old Jewish ceremonial laws for a relationship with God. It just simply don't work anymore. May we never be like those that, that Jesus described in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And it says, not everyone, and I've used this verse a ton of times, not everyone who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But thou that doest the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Or Mark 7, 6. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So the Jewish people are trying to do all these rituals and trying to do these in order to get favor with God. They didn't accept the true Messiah. So in one sense, what the Jewish people are trying to do right now, they are wasting their time. They're wasting their time. But I will say this, people on the internet, they're, they're <laughs> as usual, they're having a heyday with this, with all kinds of ideas and videos and, and pictures and stuff that they're playing and showing. Like, for instance, this, video, this picture here. This picture of this white altar looking thing. This has been all over the internet, all over YouTube and everywhere else. And they're saying that this is, you know, they built this. This is where they're going to sacrifice this red heifer at. 
I don't buy that one bit. Okay? Don't buy it one bit. I believe that the Jews would do this in secret, and there's a lot of different reasons why. One, they probably built this thing to take people's attention off of what they were intending on doing. Okay? Because if you think about it, the war that we're talking about and the war that they're in right now, the war that started on October the 7th, that is because of these red heifers. The Muslim people uh, are very uh, protective of Temple Mount right now. They've got three Muslim mosques on there, one being the Dome of the Rock, which they consider to be the second most uh, uh, precious building that they have. And they are scared to death since uh, Israel is now controlled by the Jewish people. They're scared to death that they are going to manage to get a hold of Temple Mount and go in there and knock those mosques down and put the new Jewish temple up. They don't like that. They're scared to death. So that's the reason when they see things like the red heifer and stuff like that coming in, when they see those things happening, they get upset and they want to destroy Israel. That's exactly what's going on right now. This is the reason this stuff and what we're going to be talking about next week, this war, that's the reason these things are happening. All right? Now, when you think about and you go back and you study and you find out, and I heard this uh, rabbi who was very mad. He was very mad about seeing this thing here online and all this kind of stuff. And he was, on, he was doing a, an interview with some people that I listened to. And uh, he was telling that, you know what? He said, you don't sacrifice a red heifer on that kind of an altar. You don't. He said, all you have to have is a pile of wood. He said, that's what you do. And you do it outside the city. He said, when they sacrifice a red heifer, it will be on the Mount of Olives. He said, but there's a problem with that. He said, number one, he said, you have to have a person that has never been this person that will sacrifice this animal. This person could have never been around a corpse, could never be in a hospital where there's been death, could never been in a graveyard, period. So they had as much, uh, had as hard a time trying to find and locate a young man that would meet the criteria about as much as the red heifer. But they found him. He's 15 years old. He had to be a pretty good sized kid, and he is. But this kid's never been in a hospital. He's never been around. He's been out in the country. He's never been around any death in his life. So he qualified to be the one that can kill this red heifer. Now here's another problem. On the Mount of Olives, there's graveyards. Okay? So where the land is at that overlooks the temple, the way I understand it, where that is at where they want to do the sacrifice, you got to cross the graveyard. So they were talking about they were going to have to build like a walkway of wood or something to elevate above that because if the boy or the heifer's feet touch the ground, disqualified. Okay? So now they've got to put this walkway down. So they're in the process, and I'm sure they've got this walkway built where that they can slap it down pretty quickly. I would, I would just about guarantee you that. So it could happen between now and next Monday. It could have already happened in secret, and we just don't know about it. Okay? But I believe they probably built that thing there uh, just to kind of keep everybody's attention toward that because the last thing they want is more war and more violence going on inside of Israel. Inside of Israel. Okay? So they're planning on doing that. They're going to get this red heifer sacrifice so that they can have their purification ceremonies and get ready to build this new temple. And we know that the temple is coming. We know that it's going to be built. All right. So these terror organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis, uh, they're all proxies of Iran. Iran's pushing their buttons. Iran uh, has always supplied the money to them. You know who supplied the money to Iran? We did. We did twice. Obama did, and then Joe did. Okay? So we've supplied the money to them, and yet we're going to wind up fighting the war for them. Okay? Craziest thing it's ever been. Now, there was one thing said this morning that is going to fall into next week's message, and I'll give you a little hint of it. 
In one of the prophecies, it prophesied, and it talk, it's talking about Persia, which is Iran, and it's talking about that, and it talks about the bows getting knocked out. In other words, like their missile launchers is what we would look at today. Well, just this morning, one of the uh, top guys, uh, or has been in the government, said that what is going to have to happen right now is that America and Israel is going to have to take out all of Iran's nuclear weapons, and they're all pointed right directly at Israel. So when he said that, I thought, yep, there you go. They're going to knock out the bows. So this is coming. So that's part of next week's message. All right. So I think I've got everything covered that I wanted to talk about. Uh, do I still believe that, Nick, that this war is Psalm 83? Absolutely. And some of the information I'm going to give you next week will, it blew my socks off. It probably will yours too. So if everybody likes to stand.